Hi, Dan. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Welcome to Riga. Thank you very much for having me there. Pleasure. Pleasure. Glad that you could uh, spare some time. And uh, I guess, how can, can you see the audience all right? Is my camera working? It looks... It's a, it's a good-looking group of people. There you go. That's why I came here, Dan. Anyway, right. Um... So yes, uh, I've, I've, I've said to the audience that you are my entrepreneurial guru, so I haven't bigged you up in any way, so, uh, so <laughs> I will, uh, I'll let you take to the floor now. I've talked too much already, so uh, uh, please, Dan, um, thank you, and, and, and bring it on. Thank you. How is everyone? Excellent. Let's, uh, let's participate. Let's, let's just make it as though we're... I'm there, and um, and uh, let's not be weird about the fact that I'm just on the screen. Okay, let's let's be total. Let's be totally cool. Um, I'm going to share my slides in a minute. If you hear any screaming in the background, it's my three and a half year old who's decided uh, that it's time to throw a complete fit around bath time. Uh, so it's, it's, some it's, of you can relate. It's recorded, sure. Dan. It might be the next big viral video um, after yeah, the BBC yeah, exactly. incident. Just, have you got the nanny to drag to drag her out or drag him out? I, it, it sounds like we've got a nanny. We've got the police. <laughs> we've got you know so, something's going on down there um, in the background. I hope he'll he'll calm down any minute. I'm sure. Um, so just out of curiosity, who in the audience is already an entrepreneur? You've already got a business. Could I just get a quick little show of hands? Okay, cool. And who's thinking of starting a business? Okay, cool. All right, cool. That makes that makes sense. Um, all right, just I'll, I'll sh first of all, I'll share a little bit about myself, and then I'll get into some slides, and we'll talk about this idea of uh, key person of influence. So my background is very entrepreneurial. I, uh, I actually started as my first entrepreneurial venture when I was about ten years old. Um, my mum was cooking French fries in the kitchen. And she accidentally set fire to the curtains and uh, the, the wall caught fire. And by the time everything had been put out, um, the whole house had been smoke damaged. And we had to, uh, we had to throw away all of these um, appliances and furniture and um, different, different things in the house that were covered by insurance. And I don't know where I got this idea, but I was 10 years old and I got it in my head that I could sell all of these things. I could have a garage sale and I could sell all this stuff and I got so excited about selling all of the damaged uh, things as a 10 year old and then um, I went to all, I, I realized I didn't have enough stuff to have a, a garage sale so I went to all of the neighbors and I did a 50-50 joint venture with them to get them to uh, uh, put their stuff into my garage sale and I made $300 uh, when I was 10 years old and that was enough to buy a Sega Master System and a BMX bike, um, and uh, and I mean a BMX bike at a ten-year-old is like a BMW. It was pretty pretty cool. So um, so that was my first entrepreneurial experience. Throughout high school, I sold flowers door to door. I ran uh, nightclub parties and dance parties. Um, then when I got into age eighteen, I started running proper nightclub parties and promotions. Um, and then at age twenty-one, I started my first company. It went from zero to a million dollars in the first 12 months so it really took off fast um, and then it went from one to ten million dollars in revenue uh, in the three years after that so it was a very very fast growth business by the time I was 25 we had about a million dollars a month worth of sales going through the business um, in Australia you can obviously hear I've got an Australian accent but I now live in London um, so I built that business I got out of that I exited that business and then I came to London um, and I started an entrepreneur growth accelerator in 2010. Um, today we have uh, something like 3,000 companies who are going through our entrepreneur accelerator. I get to see across 50 to 100 different industries. I get to see all the different experiments that they're trying. I get to coach them, mentor them, get them funding, all of those sorts of things. So my uh, world is all about entrepreneurship. Um, I might start the slides just so I can go through some of these. Okay, um, let me push play. Okay, cool. So um, along the way, I, I ended up writing four books. So the reason I'm Austin's entrepreneurial guru is because I think he uh, read my, my books and I wrote a, an entire series of books about the entrepreneurial journey, um, starting with Entrepreneur Revolution, 
going into key person of influence, um, running campaigns and promotions to become oversubscribed, and then building a platform of scalable assets, uh, which is 24 assets. So I wrote those books. Um, and today I run uh, Dent Business Accelerators. And as I said, um, we develop entrepreneurs who stand out, scale up, make a positive impact in the world. Uh, we operate in four countries, six cities, 27 uh, mentors, two to 3,000 graduates, um, and about 1,000 published authors. Um, so we have all of these great programs with awesome entrepreneurs, and um, we do training and accountability groups and resources and funding, and we run big conferences around the world. Every month we do uh, a conference of about two to 300 people somewhere in the world. Uh, Inc. Magazine said we're one of the top conferences in the world for entrepreneurship. Um, and Entrepreneur Magazine said we're one of the top business growth accelerators in the world. Um, so uh, between 2016 and 2034, there's a huge wave of change happening. Uh, entrepreneurship is such a huge topic because um, the baby boomers are turning 70. That's one big trend. Um, technology is uh, becoming so much more powerful, um, which is another big trend, uh, and it's uh, it's causing um, technology unemployment um, and disruption to almost every industry. Uh, the millennials um, believe that entrepreneurship is one of the coolest things ever, and it actually suits the lifestyle of millennials uh, who want to uh, have freedom from traditional employment. Um, and uh, and governments are actually disrupted at the moment. So the level of disruption has actually hit government. You can see in the UK we have Brexit, we have uh, Trump in the U in the USA. Uh, these are very much disruptive forces within the uh, within an environment. And one of the reasons for that is because business is now global and um, and uh, has globalized. Yet governments are stuck uh, on geographical models. They're local. So all of this stuff has, has caused a massive transformation. Now, I wrote a book in 2010 called Key Person of Influence, and Key Person of Influence is one of, one of the strategies as to how to ride the wave, how to make the most of the times that we're in. Um, in in uh, Key Person of Influence addresses this shape, and this shape is a shape that should not exist. Um, it's uh, a shape called income distribution. And income distribution was meant to flatten out. So in the 1980s, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. And one of the reasons that they invented the internet is they believed that if you created this incredibly powerful uh, democratization of information, that it would allow everyone to become wealthier and it would allow the middle class to really rise up and, and a much more even distribution of wealth. In actual fact, the opposite effect happened. So what, what happened since 1980 is that the top 10% of income earners uh, are now earning 300% uh, of equi in equivalent terms of what they used to earn. Um, and um, the middle has stayed the same and the um, bottom 20% has actually gone backwards. So we actually have a massive shift in income distribution where the top 10% are earning more money than ever. All the wealth is going to these top, top key people of influence. Um, so that's a big transformation, big change. Um, so I'll explain as to how to take advantage of this. And one of the key things to, to do is to um, recognize that there's two axes here. There's people who are really good at what they do. They're really um, clever. They're really talented. They're functionally very skillful. You know, if they're a photographer, they're a good photographer. If they're a graphic designer, they're a good graphic designer. But then there are people who are good at what they do, but other people know about it. So they're really good at what they do and they're a little bit famous. They're famous in their industry or they're micro famous. They've got maybe 10,000 followers uh, on Instagram or something like that that's actually giving them a real kind of push behind, uh, behind that. And we call these people key people of influence and they do five things really, really well. They pitch their business really powerfully and they pitch a vision really powerfully. They publish content uh, you know that that spreads across the internet. They create products and services that people can buy from anywhere in the world. Uh, they raise their profile so that they're known, liked, and trusted by a lot of people in the industry. And they go out and they do joint ventures and partnerships in their industry so that they're partnering with all the other key people of influence and the big players in the industry. So these are the five P's of influence, pitch, publish, product, profile, and partnership. Um, the method is endorsed by some of the top entrepreneurs in the world. Mike Harris in the UK built three multi-billion pound businesses, one after the next. He said 
that if you want to make it big, you've got to become a key person of influence, and this method is exactly how to do it. Um, Kevin Harrington built a $5 billion business in the USA, um, and he says uh, at the center of every industry, you find the most well-known and valuable people. All the money and all the deals goes to them. If you're not a key person of influence, you, uh, you should focus all your effort into the five things. Um, my friend in Singapore, Elim Chu, she's one of the top entrepreneurs in Singapore. She owns several shopping centers and a retail empire. Um, and she said, I didn't realize it, but I've been applying the KPI method, and that's how I became successful. Um, so lots of great people are describing the key, per key person of influence methodology as a very worthy uh, thing for you to focus on if you're an entrepreneur. So let me walk you through those five things. Uh, number one is pitching. So obviously the god of pitching was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs knew how to pitch technology so that people got excited about it. Uh, he was the one who you know, made us fall in love with iPhones and he made us fall in love with iPads and he made us fall in love with iPods. And it was actually the way that he would pitch those ideas. And he was, he was considered to be brilliant at pitching the vision of Apple and pitching the products, um, exceptional at, uh, at pitching. Um, but all entrepreneurs can learn from pitching and can actually change the way that they pitch and get a much better result as a, as a result. So I'll give you a quick example. This is a guy called JP, Jean-Pierre de Villiers. Um, when I first met JP, he was a fitness trainer, and he would say, if you said to him, JP, what do you do? He would say, I'm a fitness trainer. I get people to lose weight or put on muscle. I'm 45 pounds an hour or less if you buy 15 sessions in bulk. That, that's how he would have described uh, what he what he did. So not a great pitch. So we put him through a basic pitching little masterclass. Uh, this is like just a, a 30 second pitch that we we call a social pitch. Name same, claim to fame, aim in a game. So name is the name of yourself and your company. Same is put yourself in a clearly definable category. Fame, what makes you different from the rest? Aim, what are you working on in the next 90 days? Game, what's the bigger vision for your business? So at the end of that, he came out with this. Uh, I'm an author, an athlete, and a coach. I run a fitness concierge service that works exclusively with high net worth executives and entrepreneurs. My clients have achieved the best fitness of their lives despite their jet set lifestyles. I've recently hired a world-class dietitian who's given me the capacity to take on four more clients. My bigger vision is to transform the world by giving leaders more strength, energy, and fulfillment. Um, so that became his new pitch. And what happened is that his business went from about 70,000 pounds per year to about 450,000 pounds per year. And it started by just transforming the way that he would pitch the business. So that's a great example of transforming the pitch. Um, the next one is publish. And it's really important that we do publishing because we want to have some ownership of intellectual property. We want to own something. Where I'm from in Australia, uh, it was uh, form, it was colonized by the British in the 1700s. And in the 1700s, uh, the main valuable commodity was land. So when they convinced all the soldiers and the generals and the um, officers to go out to Australia, the way they convinced them to go out there is that they said, if you go to Australia, we will give you a title deed to some new land uh, in this new place called Australia, um, and you can uh, you can be the title deed owner. Now, to this day, some of the wealthiest families in Australia are the descendants of the people who were given title deeds to um, to to the land. Um, and what happened is that anything that happened in their land that involved they got paid regardless. So, if you wanted to farm on their land, they got paid. If you wanted to, you know, raise livestock, they got paid. If you wanted to um, put houses on the land, they got paid. So they have the title deed to that land. Now, today we live in an intellectual property economy, an ideas economy, and it's very similar that the new landscape is, or the new land is ideas. So the most valuable land is a piece of land called social networking owned by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he's the big king of social networking. You've got the kings of valuable land called uh, Search, uh, called Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Um, you've got the king of the land called e-commerce, um, Jeff Bezos with Amazon. And these are the big, big landholders. These are the equivalents of the kings of the digital age. Um, but actually, we can all have our own little piece of land within those kingdoms, and we need to own those land. And rather than having uh, a, a, a title deed to the land, what we actually have is published content. When you publish content, it's like owning a little piece of land. 
So I own a piece of land called Entrepreneur Revolution. Anyone who wants to go searching for this Entrepreneur Revolution concept comes and talks to me. I own a piece of land called Getting Your Business Oversubscribed. That brings in lots and lots of opportunities for me. I have a piece of land called Key Person of Influence. Um, once again, that generates a lot of opportunities. So, for example, when uh, KPMG wanted to find uh, somebody to help them with getting their team to think more entrepreneurially, they went and Googled the search term entrepreneur mindset. And uh, when they search term uh, entrepreneur mindset, the book Entrepreneur Revolution came up and they said they found me and they said, this is a person who has that piece of land. Um, when somebody recently this year decided to teach their students to become a key person of influence, all their students basically said, I'm sorry, but you're teaching something that doesn't belong to you. You're teaching an idea that belongs to Daniel Priestley. And the reason they feel that I own that piece of land is because I published the content. So it's really important that you publish. You can publish books. You can publish reports. You can publish blogs and articles. Um, you can publish podcasts and videos. The more you publish, the more you um, own, the, own the land. That is, a, that is one of the key reasons to publish. But there's another really big reason as well. And the other reason to publish is because you want to educate your market. Your customers, your clients, they buy from you because they want to solve some problems in their life. They want to solve an issue. They want to relieve uh, an unmet need. The more problems that you can solve, the more valuable you become. So if you can show people about how you solve problems, and if they can read about you and learn about you, then um, then you become more valuable in their eyes. So for every business in the room, you have two types of market that people who are um, going to buy from you. There's what's called a, um, uh, a person who is unaware of the problem that you can solve. They're unaware they even have the problem. Um, or they're unaware of any solution. Um, and then there are people who are aware that they have a problem and they're going out and searching for an answer to that. So, for example, um, let's say uh, your business does search engine optimization. Some people, there are thousands of businesses out there that are completely unaware that their business needs search engine optimization. They don't even know that what it is or they don't know much about it or they don't know the benefits that it could bring. And then there's a small number of people who are out there looking for a supplier who can help them with search engine optimization. So when you look at these two markets, there are there's a lot more people who are unaware of uh, the problem. So if you can create content, if you can educate the marketplace and make them aware of a problem, make them aware of a solution, give them education, then you become the person that they want to spend money with. So that's another really powerful part of um, creating published content. I'm seeing great examples of this in all sorts of industries. Here's a fun book, uh, John Foreman, who wrote a book about how to use data more in intelligently. Um, he has been able to attract thousands of customers uh, to MailChimp because businesses that didn't even realize how much data can be behind email marketing campaigns, they read that book, they discovered that there is so much more intelligence that could be going into their email marketing campaigns and then they said, okay, well, we'll just work with MailChimp because they're already doing all these things. So he educated the market and he brought people across. We've actually helped quite literally hundreds of our clients to, um, uh, to publish books. Uh, we have people who have um, uh, written books about going through divorce, uh, branding your company, uh, putting systems and processes into your business, improving your posture, um, uh, getting more energy throughout the day, writing jokes, um, all, like absolutely all sorts of things, people who have written books that educate the market and give them um, access to uh, ownership over uh, a concept in the marketplace. So really powerful. Um, a great example would be one of our clients, Shireen Smith. Um, she is the head partner, the founder of Asrites. It's a law firm here in London. Um, she wrote a book called Legally Branded, and it's about logos, trademarks, designs, copyright, intellectual property, internet law, social media marketing, um, so all of those sorts of things. Now, what she's doing there is she's basically owning a piece of real estate called um, making sure that your brand is legally protected. Anyone who goes looking for that concept typ typically comes and finds Shireen. Um, ever since she did this, she's got partnerships flowing in, she's got customers flying in, She's got all sorts of attention in the media.
because she decided to own that space of intellectual property um, and becoming what she calls legally branded. Now, she actually registered the term legally branded. She wrote the book Legally Branded. So um, people are actually out there saying, it's great that you've got a brand, but it's important that you become legally branded. Um, so that's a, a really powerful example of someone who's built their whole business around owning that little piece of land. The third example is products. So, or the third thing that we need to do in the methodology is create products. So here's a few ideas about products. The first one is that products and services don't make money. Product and service ecosystems make money. So I often see people who say, oh, I'm going to create an online portal that is £39 a month because I've seen somebody who launched an online portal um, and they've got 2,000 subscribers at €39 Euros a month. Um, so they've got 80000 a month just ticking in and, and I want to have that as well. Now, what actually happens is that when you go and dissect the person who's got a successful business, they don't just have one product, they have lots of products. They might have free eBooks online, they might have written a best-selling book, um, they might have consulting programs, they might have workshops that they run um, or events, they might have physical products that they send to people in the mail. It's never just one thing, it's always a product and service ecosystem. And your business really takes off when you've got a product and service ecosystem rather than focusing on just one product. So two types of products, products that help you to become known, liked, and trusted, and products that help you to deliver remarkable, remarkable value and are quantifiable and people want to pay a lot of money for them. So what we do is we break this into this whole ecosystem of gifts, product for prospects, core offerings. We take a central piece of intellectual property. Normally, we actually take people's books that they write and we unpack the intellectual property, we turn it into lots of different products. So I'll give you a couple of examples of product ecosystems. The first one is Apple, because every every person in the room understands it. Apple created a very powerful product ecosystem where they gave away iTunes for free, uh, and then people got themselves an iPod, and then they decided that they liked iPod so much that they would get themselves a uh, laptop. They then got themselves a phone, an iPad, and an iCloud account, um, and then every single week they now buy music and they buy apps and they buy subscriptions and services. Now that's called a product ecosystem. Gift, product for prospects, core business, product for clients. Let me show you a small business example. Um, this is Catherine, uh, Catherine Maslin in Australia. Uh, she was running a very small business, just her and, and her PA, running a natural health business, helping people to achieve more wellness um, through, uh, through a natural approach. Uh, she had a very, very small clinic doing about 100,000 euros. Um, and what we did is we got her to write a book, unpack her intellectual property. We turned that also into a little magazine that came out quarterly, a digital magazine. Uh, we got her a regular spot on the news doing a little two minutes for health. We turned that into a two minutes for health YouTube channel. Um, we cre She created a 10-day pop-up health challenge where people go online and join her 10-day challenge. Um, and then she discovered that she could build a much more valuable core product that included naturopathy, acupuncture, massage, hypnotherapy, and meditation classes, um, and then a, a recurring revenue business that sent through healthy food supplements. Um, and her business went from about 100 grand to about 800 grand in two years just by having a product ecosystem as opposed to having one product or service. So we do this with our clients. We get them to unpack using this framework, gifts, product for prospects, for business, product for clients. We want to have something in every single one of these categories. We want it to be linked with data and technology, sales conversations and service conversations uh, in, order to, um, in order to have a, a, fun a fully functioning ecosystem there. Um, we'll, we'll proceed on to profile and then keep your questions in your mind because we'll do some Q&A. Uh, at the end of um, at the end of the uh, the session as well, we'll have plenty of time for Q and A. So for profile, um, this is the funnest slide. I absolutely love this slide. Uh, this is called the Fruit Sticker Appreciation Society, um, and this is a group of people who love to collect the fruit stickers off of fruit, and they love to put them in little albums and to show each other. Uh, their fruit sticker collections. Now, the cool thing about this is that there's actually only 92 members of this group in the whole world, which means there's not many fruit sticker collectors. But the important thing is that they were able to find each other. They were able to connect online, 
Um, and before Facebook or before Twitter, before social media, these fruit sticker collectors would have always felt that they were lonely, that they had no other friends who were collecting fruit stickers. They would have asked around all of the people at school, at university. They would have asked their, their local, perhaps they would have put up a poster at their local shops and nobody would have said, yes, I collect fruit stickers because there's only 92 people in the whole world, world who do this. But the, the beauty of social media is that regardless of geography, it's now really easy to find each other. So this happy face that she's got, this smile that she's got, she's smiling not just because she's got a great fruit sticker collection, she's smiling because she's found her tribe of people. Now, the cool thing is this. Every single business in this room, you've got something that you love doing, that you're passionate about doing. You've got something that is your fruit sticker collecting uh, activity. And what's, what's great is that if you use social media effectively, you can build an entire business around it. You can connect with all the people in the world who love this thing. Um, we have had people build uh, profiles around um, posture. We've had people build profiles um, uh, around uh, flying World War II planes, classic cars, free diving, um, putting babies to sleep. Um, all sorts of things. We've had people become famous within these tiny little micro niches because social media gives us the power to do it. Now, in order to become famous, in order to build your profile, you actually need four key things that we call SALT, S-A-L-T. Um, and imagine somebody meets you and they want to know, are you worth your SALT, which is a very British expression. Are you worth your SALT means are you worth your reputation? Are you worth um, your money that you're asking for? So we, we break it down into SALT, S-A-L-T. Uh, SALT is social media. So um, how do you show up on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, your blog, your videos, um, uh, an, an image search? Uh, all of those sorts of things uh, are really important. Um, how do you have uh, – A is awards, associations. So um, it could be industry awards or uh, it could be accreditations. Uh, associations could be that you have a very high-profile mentor, you have a high-profile client. Um, it could be that you are a supplier to a really big company. So you might be an engineering supplier to Rolls-Royce or BMW. That makes you uh, famous by association. You might be a famous person's uh, yoga teacher. Um, that makes you famous by association. L is for live events. You can have your own events. You can speak at other people's events. You could be on panels. You could um, – uh, oops, what have I done? Uh, oh, I hit the wrong slide. There we go. Um, uh, you could have, uh, you could be a featured guest or a sponsor. You want to make sure you've got lots of photos and videos of live events. And then T is for traditional media. And traditional media, newspapers, magazines, um, other people's blogs, um, other people's video channels, other people's podcasts. So it's, it's those more, tra but I'm talking about the big ones, the branded ones. So, when you have uh, a great spread across those four areas, people see you as being a profile. Um, so uh, so that's what we, we need to focus on. Um, and sorry, in the middle there it says, you are who Google says you are. That's a really important point. If you were to sit down and have a meeting um, and you're having a really great meeting and people love what you're saying, and then at the end of the meeting you walk away and you think, gee, that's going to definitely turn into to a great partnership or some great business, Every single person who has a good meeting with you will also Google you after the meeting. And if Google says that um, there's no, there's really no profile for you, that's a very bad thing, could, could cost you the deal. Um, if there's any negative press, that could cost you the deal of negative reviews. Um, and if it's really positive, then that will cement the deal. So we want to make sure we've got all of that. The fifth one I mentioned was partnerships. So partnerships are, are amazing for overcoming the illusion of limited resources. We all think about the world as being limited resources because we grew up in a geographic, geographical area with limited resources, but we actually live in a, in a big world with unlimited resources. So if you need the money, somebody's got the money to invest, so you need to do a partnership with them to get the money. If you, if you want to become more famous, somebody's already famous, do a partnership with them, become more famous. If you want to have 100,000 people on your database, somebody already has 100,000 people on their database, do a partnership with them, get them uh, get them talking about you to their database. So this is the ability to partner with people. 
So we always encourage people to uh, focus on three types of partnerships, brands, distribution partnership, brand partnerships, distribution partnerships, and product partnerships. So if you think about uh, Nike, Nike does this all the time. If they want to release a new product and make another million or 10 million or 100 million uh, dollars, they don't uh, they don't try and win the tennis themselves. They go and figure out who's already winning the tennis. They say Roger Federer is already winning the tennis. He's the big brand. So let's work with Roger Federer as the brand. Um, they say who already makes great T-shirts. Fruit of the Loom already makes great T-shirts. Let's partner with Fruit of the Loom to, to create the T-shirt. And we'll have a Fruit of the Loom Roger uh, produced shirt with Roger Federer's name on it. Um, and distribution, they say, you know, who already has a shop in every city across America? Let's uh, just partner with Walmart and create a Roger Federer shirt that goes out to every every Walmart store. And that obviously turns into millions and millions of dollars. Um, great example would be uh, the Nespresso brand. Nespresso did a deal with George Clooney, which massively increased the brand. Nespresso was started in 1976, but it didn't take off until 2006 when they did a deal with George Clooney. Um, they used a partnership with Megamix to manufacture the beautiful home appliances, and they launched in an exclusive deal with Selfridges in, uh, in London to, uh, to have exclusive distribution. So you, you once again, you see the magic triangle brand product distribution. Great example would be Rob Gardner, the CEO of Reddington, one of our clients. He's considered to be one of the top per, um, pension fund advisors in London, if not the world. Uh, I think he was voted uh, seventh most uh, influential pension fund manager in the world by his peers. Um, uh, he gives presentations and live events, which boost his profile. Um, he's incredibly good at pitching. He's got lots of people following him on Twitter. Um, so he's, he's gone and done that. Um, he's written a book, uh, published a book for children to learn about how to save because he discovered that people's savings habits are already formed by the age of seven. Um, he did partnerships with PwC in order to expand the distribution of his business, Reddington. Um, uh, he uh, has... Um, uh, he, he, sorry, he's got all these great partnerships uh, with, the, with the people there. Um, so all the way through, he's applying those five steps. So he's pitching, he's publishing... He's, he's creating great products, he's doing profile, uh, and he's doing partnerships. And that's what makes him one of the top most influential in the world. Um, when we started with him, uh, he had about 20 employees. He's up to about 250 employees now. Um, so a couple of next steps. You can buy this book, Key Person of Influence, which explains the five uh, steps. You can buy it on Amazon. Um uh, those are the those are the key things. One little message that I want to leave you with before we do some Q and A is uh, when it comes to this Google logo, who can think what is the color of the first G in Google? Um, who who can guess what's the color? Any guesses, guys? Oh, hand up. Who's going to say? Well, shout it out then. Blue. Is it blue? Blue, is it blue? Any other guesses? Yellow. Yellow. Red. Red. Yep. <laughs> pink, it's not pink, it's definitely not pink. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is you've seen the Google logo 10,000 times, um, and yet we forget logos. Um, it's blue, the answer is that it's blue and it's always blue. Um, keep in mind that even though Google is one of the biggest brands in the world, People remember faces. They actually want to connect with key people of influence. As a small business, you have a huge advantage in the marketplace to become a key person of influence, to become known, liked, and trusted, um, to get your face known out there in the marketplace. Remember, Steve Jobs beat IBM by being a key person of influence. Um, Elon Musk is beating uh, Ford and Porsche and BMW uh, by being a key person of influence. One of the best strategies that you can do if you want to build a great business uh, is to put yourself out there as a key person of influence. Um, so I hope I've made that point uh, tonight. I've allowed um, maybe 15 minutes for questions, 15, 20 minutes. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll encourage you to have a chat to the person next to you um, for the next minute or two or three or four minutes. Talk to them about what you learned out of that five-step methodology and then what we'll do is at the end of three or four minutes, we'll come back and we'll do some questions and answers. 
uh, and we'll um, we'll finish with Q and A. So talk to the people around you, and then come up with see if you can come up with a question that you'd like me to answer. Um, uh, uh, when when we come back, go for it. Thanks, Sam. Dan, can I just have a photo? I'm going to put my arm around you, mate. <laughs> or I'll, okay. I'll tickle your ear. You can't see me. <laughs> so, Austin? Yes, Dan, I'm just getting a photo, mate. Can you look happy? Oh, okay, you're doing your photo first? Yeah. Am I smiling? <laughs> Should we do should we do Q and A after that? Yes, Dan. Uh, yeah. So, um, should we do some Q and A? Yeah. Let's go for it. Okay. Have we got some questions crafted? There was a lot of talking. We must have it. We must have a few. I've got a few written down, but I don't want to just reel my, all mine off, but... Any questions? Thank you, Inga. I, I won't chuck it that hard. Hello, Daniel. 
So big to your uh, great to see you here, uh, like sharing your insights and uh, approach to Latvian audiences. I've uh, been to your sessions in UK, uh, very valuable. Thank you for that. Uh, my question is regarding the future. So uh, obviously you are applying this uh, approach currently, this five-step approach and others. How do, you, how do you see that shaping in the future? It works now perfectly, I know that. Uh, uh, what's, what's your vision for future? So um, the future, uh, the next decade, the 2020s, um, is going to be an incredibly disruptive uh, 10 years, I believe. Um, they, I really do believe that um, right now, today, you are living the most slow-paced life that you will ever live in the future, in the rest of your life. So, if you think today's fast-paced, it's only going to get really fast-paced in the in the decade ahead. It's going to speed up. Um, there are there are some really really big trends that are going to massively transform things in the 2020s. So, um, uh, in the UK, the USA, Australia, maybe uh, in Latvia as well, there's this group of people called the baby boomers, and the baby boomers, a, a huge, massive group of people, million, tens of millions of people, they're the driving force of the uh, of the Western economies. Um, they own two thirds of all the wealth in the economy. Um, really, really huge generation. If I show you the chart, you'd be you'd be mind blowing how big this generation is, and uh, all of this generation, the baby boomers, are going to start turning seventy. Or well, they started turning seventy last year, and every single day, tens of thousands of people are going to start turning seventy. In fact, uh, every day from now for the next twelve years, there will be more people aged over seventy than ever before in a, in, in human history, and. What happens when people turn 70 is that they begin the process of transferring their wealth. They stop trying to accumulate wealth and they start to transfer wealth. Um, they sell down their big houses and they buy smaller houses. They start um, doing more travel. Their health care costs go through the roof. Um, they vote very, very conservatively. Um, uh, all, all sorts of things like that happen. So when you get a huge percentage of the population uh, who are over the age of 70 who need government care and government support, you know, that's a, that's a massive shift in, in humanity. The millennials on the other side, they have a very, very different mindset to the baby boomers. They believe in something called access versus ownership. The baby boomers believe that in order to enjoy something, you have to own it. So if you want to enjoy a car, you have to own a car. So baby boomers, they want to own lots of cars and they want to own watches and they want to own stuff, right? Um, millennials believe in accessing things. They don't. They actually think ownership is a bad thing. They want access. So rather than owning a holiday home, they just want to Airbnb homes all over the world. Rather than owning cars, they want to just have an Uber account. Um, rather than owning a wife, they want to have a Tinder account. Um, You know, they they they're 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 into all of these different things, right? Um, the millennials don't wear watches typically. They they like to just have everything stored in one place in their phone. Um, you know, they you know, so it's about access versus ownership. It's not even about um, like even just something as as humanly fundamental as music. Um, right up until the millennial generation, we love to own music. So baby boomers and um, Gen Xs love to own vinyl and own CDs, whereas millennials are really happy to just have a Spotify streaming account where they can access the music when they want to listen to it, but they don't own any music. So this is a huge shift in mindset. So on the one hand, you've got the baby boomers trying to sell off all their things and get rid of all their stuff that they own after age 70. The millennials don't want to buy it. They don't want to participate in that type of economy so they're looking to really shake up the economy in, in a big way the other thing that's happened is that you have a, a force of globalized versus nationalized so um, business wants to globalize every single person who starts out in business imagines themselves getting to the size where they could open up offices in, a, in other parts of the world or they imagine people from all over the world buying their products and services and so the natural inclination of business is to globalize. We want to have a, a big, nice global marketplace. But the natural inclination of governments is to nationalize. 
So think about every single government in the world is the first word in their government is their geography. So they say the UK government, the Latvian government, the London City Council, New York City Council, um, you know, all of that is about the geography that they operate in. So the first thing that governments think about is the geographical boundaries. There's not a single business in the world that's, that plans to grow that starts its name with its geography. You would never have the Californian Apple or the, you know, Silicon Valley Google. These businesses define themselves by their values and their vision, and they try and make it a global values and global vision. So we have two forces on the planet at the moment. We have governments trying to contain things, build walls, separate their trading you know, environments, Brexiting, all this sort of stuff. But then you have businesses globalizing. They So the perfect, what business wants in the next 50 years, business just wants 600 cities, big cities around the world, no borders. We all just trade as, as cities. And, and a lot of people in business, they feel more um, naturally accustomed to a city state as opposed to a national state. So I, li- I, si- I think of myself as a Londoner. I don't think of myself as an English person or an Australian person. I think of myself as someone who loves London because I love the open, transparent, multicultural values of London. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a massive big tug of war that's going to happen in the 2020s. And then the massive thing that's going to happen in the 2020s is technology unemployment. So the tech companies of Silicon Valley have been selling a big lie. Um, and the big lie that they tell people is that technology creates jobs. Um, they tell it to governments. They tell it to employees. Um, and technology used to create jobs. There was definitely a point in time where technology did create jobs. Technology creates jobs very short term. But just consider Instagram uh, connects, you know, 2 billion people. Um, or, or sorry, Facebook, or Instagram connects close to a billion people. It has, you know, uh, less than 50 core employees. Um, WhatsApp uh, is a major global phone network. It has something like three, four, five hundred employees. Vodafone has a hundred thousand employees. Uh, Walmart has uh, something like two million employees. Amazon has something like two hundred fifty thousand employees um, in the U.S. So. You're talking about technology does not create jobs. Technology decimate jobs. Um, you know, every time, you know, like Facebook is much, much bigger than News Corporation. News Corporation at its zenith had about 70,000 employees. Facebook has 10,000 employees and is much, much bigger than News Corporation as a, as a platform, as a media platform, as an advertising platform. Facebook is putting out of business every little local newspaper across every single tiny city, every Every city's newspapers are going out of business. I just conducted a test where I ran a full-page ad in the local newspaper, in the London newspaper, and we're generating leads off of that um, ad at a cost of about £50 per lead. On Facebook, we generate leads at £9 per lead. So, you know, Facebook's just decimating all of the jobs that are in the newspaper business. So in the in the 2020s, we're going to see... Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, um, all come together to c- totally shake up all the jobs uh, that currently exist. We're going to have medical professionals online, accountants on, you know, accounting algorithms, medical algorithms, all of that sort of stuff's going to be transformed by technology. So we're going to ha- have a great wave of technology unemployment. Um, a lot of people are so, you know, they're, they're so clinging to their job. In the UK, there are people who are still talking about losing their job in the 1980s because of Margaret Thatcher. You know, so people clinging to these jobs, it's, it's, it's our job as entrepreneurs to surf the waves, create new opportunities out of all of this. But, but the 2020s are going to be a very, very, um, transformational, uh, decade. Uh, it's going to be the best of times and the worst of times. Some people are going to have the most unbelievable decade because they embrace change. And some people are going to have a horrible decade because they hate change. Change. I think you're, you're right there, Dan, in terms of kind of riding the wave. And I think with change, it's 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 understanding that there are many opportunities and there are threats. And it's I suppose the great entrepreneurs are the ones that sort of amplify those opportunities and mitigate the threats. But on a brighter note, are there any? Are there, I, I think in many ways, I think Latvia 
speaking from someone who's 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 moved to Latvia, I think Latvians are very resilient, and 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 I think technically we can embrace change. And, and I'll, we do I'll tell do you so. this: if you if you're in this if you're in this room, you're on the right side of the wave, right? You're you're going to be fine. You're going to be totally fine. And the reason you're going to be totally fine is because all of this technology supports small entrepreneurship. It allows you to make an income from anywhere in the world. It allows you to travel freely, earning money off your laptop, using your phone, having your virtual PA, having your virtual assistants, you know, having you using these tools to create a lifestyle. Every single person in this room, by virtue of the fact that you're part of this community and that you're learning from each other, you're going to be having the most unbelievably cool decade where you'll be able to earn more money than you've ever than you've ever made, um, working less than you've ever worked, having more fun surrounded by all your fruit sticker collectors, right? And you're, you're just going to have a great time in the 2020s. The, the issue is, is that the news will go very negative and a lot of the population will be crying out saying, please help us. Um, and what you have to do is help them to shift their mindset into an entrepreneurial mindset. What are you reading at the moment, Dan? I, I, I'm going to say this because I think there are these baby boomers who are now producing great books. Uh, I read a post from you where you spoke about Phil Knight and Shoe Dog, and it was nice to see the Nike uh, triangle there. And also, uh, I think, Ray Dalio as well uh, with I love, Principles. I love Ray Dalio's. Ray Dalio's book is a brilliant book uh, called Principles, which is how he built one of the largest hedge funds in the world, $17 billion net worth that he's built. Um, and he literally, it's in, it's in minute detail exactly how he did it and the philosophies behind it. But actually, the book that I'm reading at the moment was recommended to me by Ray Dalio, and it is a book on meditation, and it's called Strength in Stillness, and it's actually one of the best books on how to meditate and, and a, a meditational path, uh, a meditational practice, uh, two 20-minute meditations per day, um, and I'm finding it really, really great. I've just been practicing meditation for the first time in my life properly, and I'm, I'm really loving it. That's great. Thanks for that, sharing that, Dan. Um, I had one other question, actually. This, yes, good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw this one this time. You ready? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Very interesting. Uh, I, I just wanted to um, ask for your insight. Uh, I'm working with virtual reality, making it more mainstream for, uh, for the architects, uh, designers, uh, to experience designs uh, in this uh, new medium uh, what 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 is your insight maybe you can share your thoughts on uh, how this market is growing so um, virtual reality um, I think a really great use case is architecture design any of the types of things that you've mentioned is a really great use for um, virtual reality um, however virtual reality requires people to do something that isn't really natural to them to put on goggles and to maybe feel a bit silly and self-conscious um, while they're in the virtual world. Um, so virtual reality requires somebody to really sell the idea, to um, to actually hold people by the hand and, and show them how to do it and make them feel comfortable with the technology. So the companies that are doing really well in the virtual reality space are actually doing a really good job in the reality space as well. So they're good at sales they're good at meeting people. They're good at sitting people down and, and making the te technology feel fun and and um, and to to make it enjoyable and to make it uh, a seamless transition. So, in order to have a successful virtual reality business, you actually have to be really good at, at selling the idea and and what, at being physically with people while they're try while they're trying this and actually bringing them across the line for virtual reality. That's that's my thoughts on it. Thank you. Hey Dan, my name hey. is Janis. Uh, I was thinking about your salt approach, and uh, eventually, for a person who starts uh, to become an uh, entrepreneur or a person of influence, uh, the social media was the first one that you indi indicate, like the salt. And uh, which channels or the networks are the most important in your opinion like to start with so you've got the big ones um, 
you've got uh, Facebook, you've got LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook is like a dinner party um, where everyone's just hanging out, having a nice social kind of thing, but it's okay to talk a little bit of business. Um, uh, LinkedIn is like a business networking event. Um, you know, that's really, you know, obviously very powerful. Twitter is actually a great listening device, trying to listen for all the influences and see what people are saying. I think li Twitter is actually a better listening device than a speaking device. Um, so it's a place to learn things. It's a place to gather insights. It's a place to follow those key influences in your space and, and be tapped into a thread of conversations. Um, Instagram is kind of like a summer party, beach party. No one's wearing any clothes. Everyone's sexy. Um, you know, it's a place to kind of show off a little bit. Um, but it's actually really good for businesses that are very visual. It's a great place to build rapport by showcasing some of your, your life. Um, the other one that's probably the other couple that I think are really important is uh, YouTube. I think YouTube is a really powerful thing. If you get a few very good videos on and you can learn about you, explainer videos, backstory videos, introduction videos, onboarding videos. You know, videos are a great place for people to educate themselves about uh, what it is that you do. Uh, and uh, the other one that's probably undervalued is uh, SlideShare. SlideShare is a place to share um, your slide decks, your keynote presentations or PowerPoint presentations. Um, and it's really powerful that if you're on the phone talking to someone or you meet someone at a social network and they say, hey, I'm really interested in what you do, one of the very first things you can do is send them the link to the slide presentation uh, for your investor deck or for your explainer deck or your, you know, something like that. So that's, a, that's also a really good one. Um, uh, yeah, to, to, to get in there and just make sure that you're using social media and it's not using you. Social media is programmed and built to use you. Um, you've got to be very disciplined not to be used by it. You've got to be disciplined to be doing, you know, to be using it as a business tool and not just get caught up in the noise. I appreciate Dan. Time is ticking. Uh, I've got one. Well, I've got one question I'd like to just throw in to uh, uh, give to you, just so that we get this done now. Can you pitch the online accelerator program briefly to the to the audience? I'm very keen on this, so I want to hear it from your mouth. Why I should potentially get involved with your online accelerator program? Great. So the online. Um well, the accelerator program that we we launched it in 2010 because I was really fascinated by Silicon Valley accelerator programs, things like Y Combinator and um, uh, you know all of the very uh, tech-driven accelerators. Those accelerators focus on 18 to 25-year-olds who can code. That's actually what they're looking for. They're looking for you know young people who have come out of school and university who are very good at coding. Um, but when you look at the statistics of who actually builds very successful companies, statistically, it's people who have 15 years' experience in their industry. On average, somebody who builds a 10 million pound business started when they were age 37. They sell it when they're age 54. Um, you know, so there's there's a 17 year journey there. Um, on average, people who start valuable companies have qualifications and experience. Um, and on average, they're not coders and they're not technology people. They're people who have general insights about their industry. So what we did is we set up an accelerator that was built around helping grown-ups to scale businesses, helping people who are not tech people, not coders, to, uh, to grow and scale businesses. And we focused it around those soft skills of making you a key person of influence. And this approach has really worked. It's helped people to win awards, get investment, help them to create product ecosystems, um, help them to become famous in their industry. We've had over 3,000 clients. We have over 150 video case studies. We've, we get like a 9.3 recommendation out of 10. People people actually, 9.3 out of 10 of our clients recommend somebody to us. Um, uh, all four books have become international bestsellers. So we set this up in six cities around the world um, and we run the program in six cities. But naturally, we actually have um, thousands of people who approach us from around the world uh, who don't live near our cities. Um, so what we did is we invested about uh, $150,000 into creating a state-of-the-art learning management system, which takes all of the information 
that um, that we put into the accelerator and puts it into a online learning portal. Um, so we actually have every single module of the five P's broken down into a learning portal, and we tee clients up uh, with a coach, someone who they talk to every single month, and actually coach them through the modules and talk to them about how they're publishing, how they're raising their profile. Um, and basically, we've put all of this together so that you get the entire learning of the entire of the program, um, and you get a coach uh, for six months. Um, and uh, we've actually made it half the price of the program. So if you do the program live, uh, it's seven thousand uh, pounds. So you know over ten thousand US dollars. Um, if you do the program with a coach um, virtually, uh, it's three thousand pounds. So it's a um, it's a really great deal. Good. Okay. Well, I think that would be interesting for people to think about. And then, if you, if anyone in this room is interested, then obviously we're interested to hear, or Dan would be interested to hear. And um, I'm keen. So, if anyone wants to join me, I'd, it'd be nice to have an accountability partner locally who would be interested in this in this program as well. That'd be great. And yeah. So essentially, if if people get in touch through you, Austin. Um, and you pass on any interest to us, our office can handle it from there. And, um, and I do, we could set up a local accountability group. Super. Okay, I, well, that's the time. That's the beauty of Skype. And I think technology, I, you'd say about embracing the change, embracing tech, kind of, we wouldn't have been able to do this three years ago. Uh, we might have tried, but the internet connection would be really slow, it would be really fragmented, and, and it, it wouldn't flow like this. So uh, I think. Well, that's three years ago, I wouldn't have had a baby, so I could have flown out to see you. But uh, as it stands, it's now time for me to go and read a, read a bedtime story. Good man. Saving your acorns. Good to hear. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Dan. Much appreciated. Quick, does anyone want a quick photo? <laughs> Give a good wave. All the best. Cheers, Dan. <laughs>